for management, you know, you're going to have to look at this as an additional thing to, to plan for. The, um, some of my uh, research that I've done, one in seven Silicon Valley billionaires have some type of emergency, major emergency plan. Um, if you look at news, some of those places are actually in New Zealand. They're actually looking at leaving the country to go somewhere else. You know, so that's something to think about. Additionally, uh, one thing, one concept that I like to talk about is having a grid down um, agent that will allow you to separate and be able to plan outside security, but also for disaster preparedness. Because a lot of times you're not gonna think about your diminished uh, resources, food, water, shelter. But just imagine if you were near the national flagpole and there was some type of emergency that happened. It could be nuclear, biological, uh, chemical, it could be uh, an EMP, it could be something that's going to drop the grid down, but what are you going to do about that? You should have some type of plan to be able to now fall back on, and that's one thing that uh, the military has given me. I apologize, didn't do a very good uh, introduction, let me back up. So, 25 years uh, military, I was in the Army, 23 years as a Green Beret. Uh, I retired in 2014, and from 2014 to today, I've been working in the private sector uh, on some classified projects with the government, as well as working with some of the people here in the audience to work on uh, basic disaster preparedness for the customer compliance. Uh, in service, I have from 1992 to, I would say 2014, I did a lot of preparation for myself and for others going into austere environments to be able to actually help people prepare if there was a catastrophic event. Um, a lot of times it would be electricity, grid down situations, or just a spontaneous event. So what we would do is we would always have contingency planning to allow uh, the mission to continue on. And it's worked very well for me from in the 90s all the way through just a couple weeks ago when I was doing some consulting. So, from the management perspective, here are some of the things that would be very useful. The first thing is assess your profile. Think about what you're gonna need during the disaster. If you have a, a group of people, three, seven, 10 people, understand what your profile is gonna be to make sure that you can have the proper resources. When I worked at American Embassy, um, one thing was protecting masks for biological and chemical emergency. And the ambassador used to tell me, I only have so many protective masks, that's all I can actually protect. If you were going to come, you have to make sure you bring your own resources. So you have to understand the profile that you have, you know, when you're doing your assessment. So now when you go into your planning, the next thing you need to do with planning is basically look at logistics and communication. Because as a protector, those are probably going to be the two biggest things that you're going to have to deal with is logistics, making sure you have everything for everybody, no matter where you are. If you're residential, it's a lot easier. But if you're on the go, and now you have a major event happen, say the power goes off and you're in the middle of a major city or in a second or third world country, you know, can you respond to that emergency? So that's one thing is logistics and uh, communication. Communication is really important when it comes to redundancy. You know, we talk about uh, a lot of technology during this presentation or this weekend. Uh, what I like to do is talk about going backwards in time and think about analog processes. Analog processes came before technology. You know, a lot of my peers would call it sticks and bricks. You know, how do you take uh, a skill that the military might give you or you can find on your own and be able to now couple it with technology? I think it's really important to have some of those skills in your toolbox or your tool bag to be able to now take something, for example, if you have drone support, but you don't have cell phone support, can you take now some type of ground to air signal with a drone overhead if you're using technology and non-technology ideas to be able to see where you are and be able to move or go somewhere? Uh, logistics, making sure that you have enough food, water, shelter uh, for everybody in the party. You know, that's a very important thing to think about. Uh, a lot of people don't think Further than the go bag, I have a bottle of water, I have some aspirin, I have some things like that. But you know, one thing that uh, I travel with all the time is potassium iodate. 
test in my day is nothing more than if you're in a radiological situation, you take it, you need to have it before you're actually in the situation. But those tools right there will give you the chance to survive uh, a radiological event, but you want to make sure that everybody has it. You know, that's something that's very important. And communication, once again, have a redundancy. Primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. You know, you hear a lot of pacing um, if you're in the military, but here in this arena, you could pace everything, your primary food source, your alternate food source, your contingency and emergency, communication, transportation, routes. All of that can be very important in a grid down situation. And so what we do a lot of times is we think about how are we going to now do a streamlined event where now you don't have the resources that you once had. So by having somebody as an additional duty or having somebody that could potentially be a focus for this type of um, planning, having a grid down person could be an additional duty where maybe it's somebody that really enjoys this type of lifestyle. Show of hands, does anyone here do any type of prepping? Does anyone think about it? Okay, there's a couple hands, all right. All right, so with prepping, you know, there's a negative connotation to that. But really when it comes to prepping, you're just going beyond or going backwards, you know, separate yourself from technology. I think that that's a very important component of being able to protect people all the time. So after you think about that, so now after you plan and you're preparing, now what you gotta start doing is start delegating, um, delegating assignments. After you delegate assignments, you also make sure that the budget will support this. You know, go bags can get very expensive. Equipment can get very expensive. So what you now have to do is you have to pay attention to your profile so you're not breaking the budget on how much do I really have to buy to have with me. You know, but if you say that everyone should be able to breathe, it might be important to have some type of air protection, some type of protective mounts. If you find that that's part of a profile that you feel that you need, maybe that should be within the budget. You know, if there are some redundancies in communication, there's different things that you look at, you might want to find that you may have to request that. So now, like a lot of people said about the soft skills, being able to actually sell this idea, because not a lot of people are going to think that there's going to be a major earthquake or an EMP or something tragic until it happens. And then once it happens, they're going to look at you and say, what's the plan? And if you don't have a plan, then right now, you might as well go home. So that's something that you need to think about. It's just a small component of the protection cycle uh, while you're with either corporate or celebrity, whether you're traveling, whether you're, whether you're at home. The other thing too is once you decide to do all this, think about testing it, all right? I do a lot of tabletop exercises uh, with a lot of different clients. I do it with churches, I do it with small groups, I do it with uh, customers and clients that would, uh, people that you would support. But tabletopping exercises is a great way to figure out where your gaps are, all right? And with that, by testing these ideas, it helps you support budget. It also helps insulate the client and customer to understand why we're doing this. And then lastly is execute. If you've come up with some plans that you need to add to your profile, exercise it. Make sure you have the equipment. Make sure it's with you or make sure it's available. And then I would say after about every eight to 12 months, do an audit to see that you still have the gear. Make sure that the people that are supposed to have the equipment are still using it, making sure it didn't expire. You know, these are some things because once the lights go out and they don't come back on, they're going to be looking at you to make sure that you have the answers. So management is really, and I use the word management very loosely, someone who is gonna take this task on to make sure that you can um, continue on with whatever you're doing, wherever you're at. So then the next part of that is testing. You know, I do a lot of tabletop exercise like I just mentioned. You know, one thing that I've learned is whoever the management is, whoever the customer is, really defines the quality of how these exercises are gonna go about. Because you can have a lot of stray voltage, you can have a lot of people come in and what if all of these things to death? And basically people become uninspired and not wanna do it anymore. But if you have one, I'm traveling in a third world or second world country, the lights go out, there's a tsunami, there is a manifestation where now there's a lot of people that are now protesting, something spontaneous. What are some of your backup plans that you can do? Okay, those are some of the things that each exercise in your tabletop discussions 
It's basically a different silo that you go from beginning to end. And that's what I was saying was the quality of it really depends on who is leading it. Another good thing is having people audit, having someone just sit there and take notes because there's, there's a lot of nepotism sometimes where people will be like, oh yeah, that sounds good, let's move on. And then really you're failing the whole idea of being able to figure out where your gaps are. You know, and if it's too big, then maybe you might table it for another day. If it's something that you could do this year or right now, then maybe that's something you should consider. So the exercises, again, the quality always goes from the management down because if the, and especially if you can get the people that you are now protecting or the, is the prime client and you can insulate him or her into it. I did something a few months ago where I found out it was very profound. I had to walk, I had to go 180 where I was doing a project and I thought I was talking to a group. What I found out was I was talking to a shepherd with a lot of sheep and the sheep never knew anything about travel plans. They were not included with anything and so immediately I had to change my way of thinking so making sure that that shepherd can now basically lift a lot more than what I thought, you know. But additionally with that, you know, we think about it, if you can insulate the group, make sure that you have a plan that everybody has a duty to do. Because you'll find that if you have one person dealing with two or three people that are not included, it's going to get very tiresome. So your tabletop exercises are really, really important. That's going to take you now to the next level, which is equipment, which is the go-bag. You know, so thinking about a go-bag, thinking about what you're going to have is really important. You know, does everybody here have some form of go-bag? Okay, a lot of people don't want to have raising hands, but I'm sure that they do. It might not be professional. It might be within your car, it might be with your family, but you have equipment with you. You know, when you do that, I think it's really important to audit, with, uh, audit everything that you have, and then about every six to 12 months, don't chase the newest piece of equipment. If you find that a piece of equipment now supports something that you don't have, then maybe that's an idea. You know, I talked about protective masks. If you can't breathe, you're not gonna be here. Okay, you may have a larger mask, but over time, that mask may get smaller and smaller and smaller, where then now you can move on to another mask. So once you start looking at gear, gear can be very slippery. But I think that it's very important to have. Because think about this. When you have equipment, it's either going to be on you, with you, next to you, or beyond you. Okay? And those levels of equipment, you know, you want to make sure that what you have on your body, next to you, and near you can support your profile. You know, and beyond that, if you are now traveling, you want to make sure that you know how to find what you need, you know, as you're traveling. You know, case in point, I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina. A lot of hurricanes, a lot of concern being near the natural flagpole about things like uh, EMPs and such. Specifically hurricanes, though. You know, one thing that I learned this last hurricane is who will actually sell you things when the, there's no power? Okay? We did not have power for about seven days. Okay, usually when there's no power, there's, there's a lot of panic. Okay, diminished resources, people are now scrambling. So now, who do you know where you can go to buy things and will they sell for you with cash? Because a lot of places right now will not sell you anything because their POS is down. Okay, I'll tell you that one place that I found worked really well, minorities within my community did not care about the POS. They would do cash and care. You know, so there was a Korean market and there was a Latin market. Now things were, were now facing rotten, you know, um, milk and cheese and stuff was going away, but you could still go get stuff because a lot of people, the resources just were starting to fall apart. So, you know, that's something to think about if you don't have the equipment with you. And then lastly, when it's beyond you further, it's like, what happens if you're somewhere and now you're trying to get to somewhere? You know, if you're trying to get to an airport, you're trying to get to your home, you know, do you have the ability to get those resources, you know, in travel? You know, because that's another thing is, you can only carry so much. You know, another thing I like to talk about is, when you're trying to go somewhere, are the roads actually useful? Can you get somewhere? You know, in the United States, they have a saying that we uh, are very effective because of lines, lanes, and lights. You know, if you take away the lines, lay, uh, lines, lights, and lanes in the United States, you have chaos. Think about it, how do we get here? We have these bumpers. We have lights that get you here. We have lanes that get you here. If that all goes away, it's chaos. Do you know how to now navigate from where you are to where you're going? You know, that's when you have that grid down SME with you 
to know how to get to where you need to get. You know, and now with that, that's additional mission planning that most people don't pay attention to. You know, and so after you have the go bag, the bottom line is you have all your equipment, you have all your planning, and now you are the person on the ground having to execute the plan that the manager gave you. You know, in the military, outside military, in a situation like this, there's a few profiles that you are going to have to deal with. First one is you're just going to hold in place. Do you have enough stuff with you to hold in place? How long do you have enough stuff to hold in place? Is it three days, five days, one day? You know, did you take into account that you are now taking, if we had to stop right now, do we have enough water for everybody here? Do we have enough sanitation for everybody to feel comfortable? You know, if you're on a campus or if you're in a residence, can you support all of that? You know, that's, that's really important to think about. So if you're on, on site and not going anywhere, make sure you have enough resources. Next one is if you're gonna move. Think about moving from here to a location nonstop. Do you know how to get there now whenever there is no power and the roads aren't working and now everybody is trying to do something because of panic? You know, whether it's an earthquake or now it's just all the power's down. Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to take a trail? Um, Charlotte, North Carolina is a good example. An interlocking trail system. Can you get from where you are to somewhere else using trails? You know, if you're in Washington, D.C., you're trying to escape around the capital area, do you know how to get from downtown to outside Virginia by using a bicycle? Do you know how where the railroad tracks will get you from here to there? These are all things that most people are not planning for because you're not expecting the lights to go out permanently, you know? But these are some things you can add to. You know, additionally, what happens if you have to move from here to a far location? You're gonna have to hold up somewhere. You know, in the military, we would have these hold-up locations that now we can use basically ground capability and air capability to be able to see where you are. If you're in an environment that have the ability to have drones or you have uh, clients that have the ability to have air assets, you want to be able to take that ground event and get the air event and bring them together, the capabilities. So if you have to now move in a hold, where are you going to hold up? Do you understand what it takes to move to a hotel? What happens if all the hotels are now... Uh, take it up because other people power, you know, like a hurricane. Coast, North Carolina, there's hurricane, everybody moves inward. All the hotels are gone, Airbnbs are gone. You know, you're better off having a, a tent and having a piece of land. I have 60 acres in Virginia. I have people that come out or at least plan to come out to stay there if there's nothing else available. Once you hold, do you have enough resources to hold until you move forward? You know, that's also something to think about, you know, in your profile. And then lastly is something that a lot of people don't think about is what happens to your dis displaced? Think about the wildfires, thinking about something that now you are displaced from the place that you decide to hold up. Do you have the ability to move all your resources with you? If you get displaced, I like using the word displaced versus evacuation because if you're evacuated, you are now part of somebody else's system. You might have a team of six, a team of four, a team of two, that if you're evacuated, now you're in somebody else's system, you have to now deal with the way they're gonna do things. You know, men may go over here, women will go over there, until you go back to where you're coming from. You know, a lot of this disaster preparedness planning is atypical to everything that you hear about, you know, specifically like this conference, but it's just one more component of readiness. You know, being able to look at it beyond the, the person or, you know, the, uh, the human risk is now how do you take the environmentals and be able to now win that capacity? You know, some of the things about go backs too is I think there are some absolutes. You want to make sure that you can breathe. You want to make sure you deal with, like I was saying earlier, um, radiation. The other thing is being able to communicate. You know, I know that there's medical, there's other things, but doesn't mean that there's a life threatening event, but being able to communicate and be able to bring you plus one other person together is a very important uh, component, because what happens if you're doing it in advance and you're by yourself in a unknown country, in an unknown place, and now you're stuck? You know, make sure you have enough equipment with you. What happens if you're now somewhere, it could be in the middle of America, and now do you have the ability to now bring everybody together and move on somewhere? So, the reason why they brought me in was specifically about this, was that additional component outside of the terrorist, outside of the uh, human, type of security is, and another element of security is, is the preparedness piece. Uh, I know that, I think I only had about 20 minutes, that's why I started a little bit. I got about five minutes before four o'clock. Um, are there any questions about preparedness that uh, 
someone might want to ask about. What do you recommend in sense of communication? What equipment? I'm from Puerto Rico. We had uh, we lost power. We lost everything. No communication whatsoever. I was without communication for a month. What do you suggest that's out there that I can use and have as a form of communication? Okay, communication. So let's talk about technical. Cell phones, you can do multiple things. You can do regular cell phone communication. You can do, and I, I'm going to get to, I know the tower's down, but there's redundancy in a cell phone. Okay, if you don't have that, you might have a, a in reach or some other type of satellite device, you might have a cell phone. You know, one way you can communicate with people without communication is basically lack of communication. Meaning that you're in Puerto Rico, a storm happened. You're expecting people somewhere else is expecting you to talk every four hours. Okay, so they wait four hours, no communication. Wait four more hours, no communication. At that point, they call you, they can't talk to you. There's already a system in place for them to now respond and support you with a lack of communication. Does that make sense? But that's pre-planned, you know. So that's just one way to connect you and say mainland and then be able to move forward. So that's one piece with communication. Anything, oh, another part about communication. Who here still has a landline? You ever still have a landline? You know what I'm talking about when you plug into your house? Okay, I do. FCC, they made sure that landlines can withstand a lot of natural disasters. I have a $10 phone I bought from Amazon. I travel with it because if I see a jack and I stick it in, there's dial tone, I can talk to somebody. I don't have to worry about cell phones and satellites. I don't know what the situation is. Um, there's a question over here. Yes, hi, good afternoon, yes. Um, I'm currently a member of CERT, and you're in the response team for my local community. What's your take on ham radios, cell power crowd, no signal? Big young because I live in California, but for the capital of the world. Um, we were trying to get a case of three miles to crowd on the river within two days. Ham radios, what's your expertise in using ham radios in a natural disaster event when no satellites, no signals around the cell phone you use? So, ham radios, I think that's a great tool, but you are, it's an educated way of communication. A ham radio is they're now, they used to be analog, now they're digital. You probably still find analog, but a ham radio will allow you to reach a lot further than a lot of other radio systems. Um, I think that if you have a community, uh, you said you were part of the CERT group where you are. CERT is another great resource, C-E-R-T, you can look it up. It's how you bring yourself together with FEMA in preparedness. It's also a great, great way of now interlocking yourself, at least domestically. Um, I'll get back to the ham radio in a second. But if you're a CERT person and you have a CERT helmet and a CERT badge and a CERT clipboard and you're trying to get through a roadblock and someone looks at you and say, hey, I gotta take these people, we have a meeting, they're probably gonna let you go through because you look like you're important. It gives you the ability to pass through lines where right now they're monitoring who can and cannot go through. But ham radios is a, is a great tool, but it's, it's, it's uh, expensive and it's also a hobby. So you look it up, I, I think it's a great thing. And really, if, if that's what you like, yes. Yes, sir. My name is John, and uh, it's listening to how you apply emergency preparedness for an organization. What are your thoughts on employing the I ICS command system and assigning the roles in a micro level? I think the issue with that is I like going, I, I like it as a good idea, but I like to start analog. Yeah. And once, every, and analog is basically what I'm talking about is pencil and paper meeting with people, you know, being able to understand what you're supposed to do and then insert that yep. because I think it all works in concert together, but you want to make sure that person understands what what he or she is responsible for. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you assign that role, you're kind of giving them a sense of empowerment and then you kind of coach them along with that role. Yes. If you're going to be the incident commander. Yes. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna have people that are, are gonna panic. If you insulate them into the problem, you know, you're gonna give them an idea of finding a job. If you're just sitting there twiddling your fingers because there is, there's no Facebook, there's no social media, you become lost. So you empower them you know, to be able to do something. If you wanna have, like we were talking about your si uh, systems of, of, of equipment, if you have one bag full of gloves, leather gloves, okay, close to you, 
Everybody here, if I throw, start throwing you gloves of various sizes and there's a major thing, everyone's gonna lift, you know, lift and do something, right? We're all able bodies all wanna contribute. But if it's hot, cold, or sharp, you're gonna be watching other people. You know, but having the idea of bringing these people together with something to do will, will empower everybody. Could we, could we build resilience as well? Yes. Yes, and resilience is nothing more than cross training. You know, I'm not talking about hard skills like medical. It's just like, do you know how to run um, if the lights are out? Can you run traffic? You know, can you account for people? You, you know, simple things like that for a lower level. You know, but that plus start are great tools to, to get the mindset. Anybody else? We are, I think, at 4 o'clock. Yes, we are. So um, I'm going to be here for the rest of the conference. Uh, I know it was kind of a rough start for me, I apologize, but I, I've got a lot that I've done in the last 30 years regarding preparedness operationally in the government and outside. If you guys want to strike the conversation, I look forward to it. Thank you.